Well, do we have a lovely lunar eclipse coming up for you on May the 5th? It's a powerful one, and it is the last lunar eclipse, or the last eclipse, in fact, in the sign of Scorpio for another 19 years. We do have one more eclipse in the sign of Taurus that is actually coming up on October the 28th, and that will be a lunar eclipse as well, which is also a full moon eclipse. But eclipses follow a 19-year cycle, and um, the eclipses are new or full moons that take place near to the lunar nodes, which are the actual point on the ecliptic. And so that means the sun and the moon are very close or on the ecliptic for, um, of course, the sun is always on the ecliptic, but the moon is there with the sun for eclipses. Now, eclipses, um, we usually have four or five a year. Um, so they're pretty regular occurrences. And I'm recording this on the day um, of the new moon eclipse at 29 Aries, which is a wallop of an eclipse. But we then have the new moon eclipse followed by the full moon eclipse. So I'm going to talk to you um, all about that. OK, <laughs> but first, before we do, I pulled a card for this eclipse that's coming up and it's at 14 degrees, 58 minutes of Scorpio. And you cannot make this stuff up, but I actually did shuffle and shuffle and shuffle and pulled this card, and this is the 14, 14th card of the Major Arcana of the Tarot. And it's the art card in the Toth Tarot, and it's one of my favourite cards because my life path is a 14-5. And this art card is the principle of um, integration, synthesis, and synergy. And I want to read you a quote that goes with this card. This is from the book by Angelis Arian. The point is to unify and harmonize the opposites, both positive and negative, by discovering a ground which transcends and encompasses them both. And that's from Ken Wilber, No Boundary. OK, that's his quote. And this is actually a Sagittarius card. But we have a um, Scorpio full moon eclipse, which means that the moon will be in Scorpio and the sun in Taurus. But they are at 14 degrees. And here I pulled this card. And, and to me, it's alchemy. Uh, look at it. This is, uh, you know, mixing of all opposites, all polarities, all in this alchemical um, cup, um, trying to create gold out of what we already have. And to my mind, that is a real um, metaphor for this eclipse, to be honest, coming up. So before I dive into the rest of this, if you don't know who I am, I am Louise Eddington, the Cosmic Owl of Cosmic Owl Astrology. So welcome to anybody who's new to my channel, to all of those uh, people that are supporting me um, in growing my YouTube channel. I'm really grateful for you. I'm grateful for all your subscriptions, all your thumbs up, all your comments, any shares that you can do. And um, notice that I will also on this channel, Cosmic Owl Astrology, be doing both these podcasts, be doing other videos. I'm going to be starting to do more little shorts. I also post my posts to YouTube. So there you go. And um, this is a part of my move away from Facebook because Facebook just does not feel aligned for me much anymore. You can also find me on Substack. I have a Substack newsletter. Uh, Substack's a great thing for writers who write long posts, which I do. And uh, it has an app where you can actually read the posts. I also post my long posts to medium.com under Cosmic Owl Astrology. Okay, so let's dive into this eclipse and let's have a, well, let's have a look at the number first. I've given you the card and it was the 14 card, but 14 is really a number of self-initiative, unity and justice. The, the great need for 14 is to achieve balance, harmony, temperance and prudence. 
put 14 can be very single minded, but it really is a number of change. OK, and it's it's really an, a number of innovation and change because uh, the receptive quality of the number five, one plus four, keeps the five, 14 open to innovation and change. 14.5 needs a real constant challenge or they can become bored. And, and so there's a lot of change on this um, energy. Also, of course, if you look at the degrees of the signs and when we look at the chart, we'll look at that. This is at 14 degrees, 58 minutes. It's halfway through a sign, which I always think is a tipping point or a turning point or a change point as well. There's a lot more about change in there as well. But of course, as I said, this all adds up to a number five. And the five itself is about personal freedom. It's about individualism. It's about being unconven unconventional, adaptable, versatile, uh, full of variety and change. So even though this is an eclipse in um in a fixed sign, Scorpio, there is a lot of change coming in this. OK, now eclipses, um, they usually come in pairs, sometimes threes. As I said, the energies are just extreme and heightened during eclipse season. As I record this on the Aries eclipse, um, the Aries hybrid solar eclipse, uh, we're having these very random um, aggressive, out of the ordinary um, incidents. Like there was a young man who was just went to the wrong house looking to pick his brother up and an 84 year old man just shot him through the door. Then there was a young lady who was in a car with friends and they drove up the wrong driveway in up, upstate New York and the owner came out and shot at the car and she died. She got shot in the neck. There's kind of these more extreme events. And often during the um, eclipse season, and especially this one, I have to say, it feels like the world is falling apart. I still maintain that, yes, we are in challenging times, but we are going to be OK ultimately. But know that during eclipse season, everything seems extra. People are extra um, assertive. People, energies are extra emotional. Um, eclipses are like full and new moons, really, on steroids or, or on acid, whichever you want to say. So know that if anything, if everything feels very heightened, know that this is what happens during eclipse season. Now, eclipses happen every 19 years, so um, at the same spot. So if you go back to 2004, we actually had um, an eclipse on April, a solar eclipse on April the 19th, 2004, and then on May the 4th, 2004, that were at the same degrees. So actually 19 years and a day to be exact. You can also go back to 1985 and, and think what these eclipses may have brought around those times. Not that any one eclipse is exactly the same though, because <laughs> um, all the other planets are usually in different places by then. So on that note, let's have a quick look at the chart and um, then I'll talk about this eclipse. All righty, so I just want to get rid of that. And here's the eclipse. So as I said, an, a lunar eclipse is a full moon. So this moon is in the sign of Scorpio and the sun is exactly opposing the moon at 1458 Taurus. Now, this is a south node eclipse and it's a partial eclipse. So the nodes, the, the south the south node and the moon are not, not very close together. In fact, they're over 10 degrees apart, which makes this a partial eclipse. In fact, it's actually a pre, penum, penumbral, a penumbral eclipse, which is a bit more than a partial, but it's not a total eclipse. So, you know, it's, it's nearly going, the moon from our perspective is nearly going to cover the face of the sun at night if if you're lucky enough to um have it happening at night for you 
um, it will be visible because it is a lunar eclipse and uh, they are visible at night. Solar eclipses, if they're happening in the day for you, are visible in the day if you're in the right area of the world. Anyway, enough of that. Enough technicalities. This one is a penumbral eclipse, so it's not quite as powerful as a total eclipse. However, the sun, the Taurus sun over there is conjunct the sign of the planet Uranus. And the sun and Uranus are about to have a conjunction, which will happen just, uh, just over four days after this eclipse. And that eclipse, the, their conjunction, the sun and Uranus, it starts a new sun Uranus cycle. And not only that, this happens one minute after Uranus passes the degree it went retrograde at back in 2022. So, and Uranus is like sudden events, ahas, lightning bolts, slaps around the head, um, lightning bolt awareness, shocks sometimes, surprises, expect the unexpected with Uranus. So the fact that this is a heightened full moon eclipse conjunct Uranus with the sun and Uranus about to be conjunct after Uranus starts to track new ground for the first time in 84 years, because Uranus cycle is 84 years, means that things are going to like kind of explode in my opinion. <laughs> OK. Now then. This, the sun is also uh, widely conjunct to Vesta. Vesta is the sacred flame of the hearth and its focus, commitment and devotion. And in the sign of Taurus, Vesta is about um, being focused on embodiment, embodying your values, embodying your connection and commitment to stability and sustainability. Then this Mercury. Mercury is conjunct Vesta and conjunct the sun on this eclipse also. But Mercury stations retrograde on um, April the 21st and will be retrograde until May the 14th. And just three, uh, four days before the sun and Mercury were Kazemi. So as I record this, Mercury is not quite retrograde. Mercury is, I'm, I'm recording this on April the 19th. Mercury is going retrograde on April the 21st. We'll have had the Kazemi, we'll be in the second half of the Mercury retrograde. So I'll talk about what that means. Also, by the time of this eclipse, other changes that have happened are that Pluto is going retrograde. Pluto stations retrograde on May the 1st, I believe. Yep. And um, so at uh, this degree, so Mer Pluto is still stationed on this full moon. That makes that more powerful as well. And I'll talk about why. And Pluto is heading back to Capricorn um, and will be, will head back into Capricorn for um, um, a lot of the second half of this year and I'll talk more about that late in a little bit as well. The other big thing that's changed by um, the time of this eclipse after me recording is that Mars is the traditional ruler of this eclipse. Pluto, by the way, is the modern ruler. So we've got big changes happening with both of them. Mars has been out of bounds since October 2022. I think it was the 15th or the 17th of October. That means he's been way off the ecliptic. Mars is back in bounds on this eclipse. He's back to normality. However, Mars is still in the sign of his fall, which means he's not at his best. He's a bit hypersensitive and hyper emotional often in the sign of cancer, hyper protective too, which can be a good thing, but he's going to be a little bit ten tender and sensitive. And he's just come out of this long, long journey since October last year, where he went out of bounds. Then he went retrograde at the end of October. He, he was seven months in the sign of Gemini. And then when he moved into cancer, he was still out of bounds. 
we've been he's been very erratic and extreme behavior also but yay mars is back in bounds however still in the sign of cancer and as i said pluto stationed so both rulers modern and traditional of scorpio of the sign of scorpio have an event happening also so i'll talk more about all of that now, there's no huge, huge, huge aspects to the eclipse other than the conjunctions, except this full moon is square to Chariclo or Chariclo, the grace spinner, the spinner of grace, and also square to Hygieia in Aquarius. And this is holding space for healing our uh, nervous systems as we go through this amazing time of of huge paradigm shifting change so i'll talk about all of that as well the last thing that i will be talking about is how maya how maya is moving back into the sign of libra she's going to be in the sign of libra till i think october of this year and then she finally moves back into the sign of scorpio for for good She's been in the sign of Libra since 1994, I believe. So even before the last lot of eclipses, she's had a long journey in the sign of Libra. And now she's moving into this fertile composting sign of Scorpio. And I talked, uh, she's in this ongoing square to Pluto, which I'll talk a little bit about. But I did write an article about that that's on both my Medium blog and my Substack blog called The Aspect of the Decade, um, which I consider it to be, because Pluto and Haumea will be in this ongoing square right through to 2000, sorry, 2028, and their first exact square was 2022. So giving orbs for applying and separating, that's this whole decade, is dominated by this pluto Haumea square. All right, so let me stop the share and get to talking a little bit about this. So first of all, as I said, Scorpio is this composting, uh, fertile water sign it's watery ocean depths and if you think of the deepest deepest part of the ocean where the water's really where you you know it's so still so weighty it's got the weight of all that other water on top of it this is Scorpio it's deep it's a little bit immovable it's um, it holds things down and in. That's very Scorpionic. But Scorp this full moon is, as I said, the last one in the sign of Scorpio before the nodes change signs in July. And the nodes are moving back into Aries and Libra, by the way. So more on that later. This is a south node eclipse. This is about releasing something. This is about... Uh, finishing up something that we've been journeying through for almost the last 19 months through this eclipse season through the last eclipse season of um 2022 which was in oh, let me read you tell you where those eclipses were that was october the 25th and November the 8th, we had two eclipses. And in fact, November the 8th was at 16 Taurus, so almost the reverse of this one. And then back in April the 30th, 2022, and May the 16th, 2022, we had Scorpio Taurus eclipses again. This is finishing up this journey of this um, Scorpio Taurus journey. And on the South Node, this is asking us to release attachments, release what we're holding on to with our fingernails, especially around power dynamics, uh, sexual dynamics, intimacy dynamics, all that kind of thing. Where are we bit perhaps being um, a little manipulative or allowed ourselves to be manip manipulated? This is uh, time for to let go of that, ready to launch into a whole new phase, a whole new cycle once the nodes are in Aries and Libra, which will be a whole different vibe. Then at the, and at the north node end of this eclipse in Taurus, that's all about sustainability. 
stability, um, the material world, the senses, embodiment, with the conjunction with the sun, our core, very core self, being conjunct Uranus, it has an air of awakening, um, also sudden release. It's like, okay, I've really got to suddenly let go of this. Let's just let go. And then Vesta, the sacred flame in Taurus, in the midst of all this, and Mercury retrograde, we are reviewing what we're committed to around the air, um, areas of stability and sustainability. Now, this, this does feel quite shocking to my mind. And we do have to remember that this is a full moon and that this is in Scorpio and that Uranus is conjunct the North Node and Taurus is the sign, is the energy of the material world. It's the most earthy of signs. This, to my mind, is rather worrying in terms of things like um, floods, mudslides, landslides, um, uh, big, big earth moving events involved, particularly involving water because of the Scorpio. I have noticed a tendency with just any Scorpio full moon, let alone eclipses, for there to be a flood kind of event somewhere. I'm a little concerned about it here in Utah where I am because we had record snowpack um, that we had two over 230 percent I believe of normal snow and whilst at the moment the temperatures are staying quite cool and the melt-off has not been too fast and we've not had any major flood events that could change at any time and the closer it gets to this full moon, the closer um, I'll be getting to being a little bit concerned about that, especially if I look at the long range forecast. Um, it's heading up into the 70s, which is still good at the moment. But as I know, living in this um, place, the temperatures could suddenly shoot up, have a fast melt off and cause and cause some kind of flooding. But we've already had mudslides and things. And I'm only talking about Utah because that's where I am very intimately connected with because I live here. But take that out into the rest of the world. I think there could be other events like that. Now, take that out of the physical world into the emotional body. The moon is our emotions and it's heightened floods of emotions, too. I think there could be some quite, um, I'm going to say there could be some quite traumatic events in the world around this eclipse season and leading up to this full moon. Mars still out of bounds until just before this full moon eclipse in the sign of cancer, more water, more emotional, more about the basis of security as well and what makes us feel safe our home, our family, all that nurtures us is Mars is in there. And on this eclipse, Mars will be in a square to um, to Eris, the um, shit stirrer who likes to stir things up in the world. Then we've got Pluto, the modern ruler of this eclipse, is stationed retrograde. Yes, he's actually stationed retrograde on May the 1st, but he's still at that station point. And Pluto stations tend to be real diggers in, okay? And Pluto is stationing at zero Aquarius, where I think he's, uh, I read that he was spending over 80 days at zero de degrees Aquarius this year. And this zero degree Aqu Aquarius is a very hot spot. Um, it's where Jupiter and Saturn met on December the 21st, 2020 for the Great Conjunction, which um, we have a great conjunction of those two every 20 years. And over time, that shifts elements. And uh, the Great Conjunction at the end of 2020 was actually called a Great Mutation into the Age of Air. So think of air pushing all that water and earth as well. So it's just... You know, think of it in terms of the weather, but also in terms of yourself. That's a lot of push 
movement okay and plus mars is in water sign as well but um also pluto state uh, pluto is the excavator pluto reveals things and at zero aquarius that fool's degree he's gonna dig be digging things up and if we think back to uh, december the 21st 2020 the insurrection happened not long afterwards on January the 6th, 2021. Um, then in 2022, um, as Venus had been retrograding the sign of Capricorn, Venus and Mars last met at zero um, Aquarius. And now we have a Venus, um, well, Venus rules the sign of Taurus, which is the where the sun is on the full moon. And Mars rules the sign of Scorpio traditionally, which is the eclipse. So we have those cosmic lovers um, and their dance as well, highlighted by the Pluto station at zero Aquarius, which is a real kind of dig in. OK, then we've got Mercury. We're right in the middle of this retrograde as well. Um, the actual Kazemi between the sun and um um and mercury happened on may the 1st which was the day that pluto stationed retrograde exactly so we're really getting the messages digging in i think there's a lot coming back to roost on this eclipse a lot coming up to the surface being dug up being revealed that has been happening since um, that great conjunction at the end of 2020. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of secrets revealed, a lot of things that have been hidden, um, things are gonna come to light and it's gonna be um, quite the challenge to be quite honest with some of this as well. And especially with Uranus, the revolutionary planet conjunct the sun, and about to start that new cycle just about four or five days after this eclipse. I think some of the um, some of the things that are going to be revealed and that come to light are going to be quite shocking, to be quite honest. I do love that this eclipse is square to Chariclo, Centaur Chariclo. The spinner of grace, the space, space holder, the co cosmic midwife. She's holding space over there in Aquarius and she is at 13 Aquarius, which is the number of the goddess, the number of the witch um, and almost in an exact square to this full moon. That's the most um, exact of all the aspects, even of the conjunction to Uranus and Chariclo. I think is helping us to birth the age of Aquarius and she's there holding space going don't worry it's kind of this is just another turning point it may seem a lot right now but we're he I'm holding space for the healing we are heading in the right direction this more humanitarian caring egalitarian future that I do still believe is coming ultimately but I still think this eclipse is going to be a little bit gnarly. I kind of like that Hygieia, which is preventative health and in Aquarius is very much to do with like the nervous system and, and our collective health as well is also um, square and is most closely square to, uh, the, to the planet Uranus. It, we're going to get some ideas about our preventative health on this eclipse and this forms a fixed t-square which is like it's time to bring more stability back into the world um it's time to recover some sense of safety security and stability and mars going back in bounds really speaks to that as well to my mind okay what else is there to speak about? Well, there is one more aspect I did not talk about. Then I'll talk a little bit about how may. Um, the, uh, the full moon eclipse is also in a trine aspect to Nessus, which is revealer of abuses. And while Nessus has been involved in a lot of the uh, new and full moons for the past uh, 
three or four months. Nessus in Pisces, he's um, pulling the curtain back on abuses of power and revealing them. And we've had the Fox News settlement with 700 and was it 82 million um, given to the Dominion voting system because they basically, uh, the Fox News lied about the election being stolen when they actually knew it wasn't. And, um, and so things like that are being revealed, real abuses of power. I think there's way more to come out about that. That's not the most exact aspect, but it is aspected again, and it has been very closely aspected by some of the um, recent lunations. Um, Haumea. Haumea is back into the sign of Libra. And um, Haumea, as I said, will um, be in the sign of Libra until, oops, <laughs> bear with me. Oh, that's because I want to go where she's back into Scorpio. She'll be back into, oh, it's November the 13th, 2020. No, that's, bear with me, the next one. October the 1st, 2023, Haumea, or Haumea, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. Um, she is retrograded back into the sign of, um, of Libra, and she'll be there until October the 1st, just finishing up her journey in the sign of Libra. And Haumea in Libra really has been about partnership, about how we partner, but she's birthing new alliances and new partnerships. And we can see that the whole world is still in disarray, right? With um, who's partnering with who? Is 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 Z uh, partnering with Putin? Who's partner, who is uh, Biden now part partnering with? Who are the USA partnering with? Who is Macron partnering with? You get all, you get the idea. You know, we've had Brexit as well, break apart. Alliances have broken down. New alliances have formed. How may is going back in and um, by this lunar eclipse. So I can't remember the day she exactly slips back into um Oh, I do remember. She is right after the uh, eclipse that I am um, recording this on. So I am recording this on April the nineteenth. Overnight tonight, on April the and into April the twentieth, Haumea slips back into uh, Libra, and will be there until October the first. And that's really going to be a time of revisiting um, what our alliances are, who our alliances are with. And again, this is not just about global alliances. This is about our own alliances, who we're in partnership with and um, and so on and so forth. So I think that's everything about this eclipse. I just do think it's going to be some, I think there's going to be some wild weather. Eclipses, like in general, really kind of stir things up and are heightened because, as I said, they're new and full moons on steroids and so things are very heightened but I, it, I do love that we're finishing this journey in Scorpio and Taurus as I said already we do have another Taurus eclipse and that one will be at five Taurus on October the 28th by then the nodes will be in Aries and Libra though so that'll be a whole different flavor but we'll I'll talk more about that later but the last South Node Scorpio eclipse for another 19 years. So until, mm, when's that? <laughs> 2042, I think it's 2041 will be the next, exact, the first one. Frank, I can't probably tell you. No, I can't. Okay, so let's look at the symbols. And before I do, before we look at the symbols, I would like to ask you to subscribe to my channel, give me a thumbs up, leave me a comment, um, and watch to the end of the video. Um, I'm still debating whether to start doing all signs um, videos again. I know people love them, 
but I'm a bigger fan of people understanding their own chart and finding where it actually is in their chart and using the um, house system they prefer. So yes, that means understanding an element of astrology. But if you can find out where Scorpio and Taurus are in your own chart, you will, this will be much more effective than an all signs video. Um, all signs forecasts are kind of accurate to a degree, but uh, they're not my favorite thing to do because they're so general, but eh, we'll see. Maybe I'll change to doing it. The Sabian symbol for this full moon is children playing around five mounds of sand. Rudyard's keynote is early steps in the development of a mind seeking to be attuned to the higher level of human evolution. So uh, Rudyard says that the human's essential destiny is to develop as a five-fold being, a pentagram or a five-pointed star. Uh, that's the Venus star, and I have a pentagram on Five symbolizes mind and, of course, five, 14, five, we've got the number as well. But five symbolizes mind in its most creative and penetrating aspect, while number four refers to the life processes operating at present within the Earth's biosphere. Um, it also um, refers to the number of digits we've got. Um, so many things in the human body is related to five and so many things in nature. It's the most prevalent number in nature. And that reminds me, I do have my Venus retrograde class coming up. Registration has started. There is a payment plan. You can find the link in the description below. Okay, so anyway, our Western civilization has realized only the lower level of this vibration five. That's the mind contaminated by compulsive instincts and emotional involvement. Some individuals, however, are born with a special potential for development of the higher creative mind. And in social, um, and in social circumstances favoring this development, in most cases, they are still playing around with this, their unusual capacity. They're in the kindergarten stage of this higher mind development. And anyway, he says the keynote or the, the key words are that this is about future oriented growth. OK, so if we think about this five uh, with um, it, the five elements, we have uh, fire, um, earth, water and air. And then we have spirit, which is kind of the fifth one as well. So it's really about coming into alignment with all the elements of the five pointed star. And that's what my Venus retrograde class is all about. So, yay, join me in that class. So the Chandra symbol for this uh, full moon is a woman with a gold tooth, an extraordinary gift, very abusable and utterly redemptive. You invent, conceive, bring into being whatever you hope for and whatever you dread. Usually the dreads come up more first and dominate for a while. In this cycle, you scare up the world's most extreme melodramas, each one of them marked no way out, no way through. If you should outlast your dread demons, and you shall, you will find in a very different direction that there are equally powerful hope angels. You hope and wish and yearn for everybody to go free. And this wishing has deep uncanny powers or power for you have been nourishing for a very long time two counteracting worlds, one dark and heavy with foreboding, the other swept clean by the magical well, will to bring the world round, around right. The one who made the light go out brings the light back in a seasoned, tempered form. And this renewed light is phosphorescent, glowing in the world's darkness, seeing the way clear, knowing it can be done. Now, 
the dark, heavy foreboding feels like the Scorpio South Node, to be honest. And I think as we get closer to this full moon, I think we will first be feeling this heavy, foreboding, dark energy because the world does seem to be falling, going to hell in a handbasket. However, there is phosphorescent glowing in the world's darkness light if you if you look for it and the more you can find look for that you more you will find it and then <coughs> oh excuse me you will <coughs> oh, sneeze supposed to be like spirit coming out or something anyway this uh, oh and i've just noticed okay I really want you to look at this card. Before I go, I'm going to read a bit more about it from Anjali Zarian, because I turned my calendar to May just to record this, because this eclipse is in May. I'll turn it back after I did. And if we look at this and look at that, that circle, that halo, that eclipse around the head, and we're on this solar eclipse, we are to find the light inside. Vesta is conjunct the sun on that. That is the sacred flame within each of us. This is the principle of integration, synthesis, and synergy. And I'm not going to read it all, but it says, the light and dark of our nature needs to be incorporated before we can fully express the whole of, whole of who we are. This is represented by the light and dark arms and faces which combined, which when combined, create the balanced and tempered being and extrapolate that out to the world, right, of mixing everything, all people. And I want to give you some of the, a couple of the affirmations that could help you on this eclipse because it is intense energy, this. I am a creative, well-integrated individual. I am as strong in my magnetic nature as I am in my dynamic nature. I express the artistry of who I am in states of balance and integration. I experience temperance when I equally value the light and dark within my own nature. So I'll leave you with that. A full moon, an opposition, integration, temperance um, and integrating the light and the dark and that's what this full moon is all about and I sit with Chariclo in holding space for your healing and until next time namaste <laughs>